And then last week, we talked about verses 8 through 10, where Paul kind of seemingly goes on this tangent and talks about this very interesting and maybe confusing idea of Christ ascending. And he repeats it over and over again. Christ has ascended. How could anyone? And Anyway, it's just this long three-verse discussion about ascension. And what we took from that is we know from verse 7 when Christ says he's apportioned it, he's given out spiritual gifts to everyone. No one is devoid of a gift. No one is left out. But verses 8 through 10 and all this ascension talk tells us he's in a position to hand out gifts because he is a conquering king. When you ascend, it doesn't mean to physically go up. It means to come into power. And King Jesus has come into power because he has conquered everything here that enslaves any human being. He's conquered it all. And when good kings come into power, when they return, good kings take the wealth from which they have gathered from conquering and hand it out to their people. Give gifts to their people. Greedy kings don't do that. When greedy kings win and ascend to power, they hoard and hold on to all the stuff they've taken. Good kings don't do that, and that's why Paul took a three-verse tangent to explain Christ is in a position to apportion the grace he talked about in verse 7 because he's a conquering king. And when he comes home, he gives gifts to his people to free them and liberate them because that's exactly what he did when he was here. Now that gets us to where we are today in verses 11 and 12. So look with me there. Paul continues and says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So before we go further, I want to zero in on just one word in that paragraph, and that's the word equip. Because it's a fascinating word. It's the only time it appears in the Bible. Old or New Testament is right there. And depending on what Bible you're reading out of, you may have a different word in there. We've had a hard time in English capturing this word. So we've used equip, we've used prepare, we've used perfect we've used all kinds of things but here's the image associated with it in the original language the image is to bring back into alignment because something has been taken out of alignment or dislocated have you ever seen anyone with a dislocated injury I had the unfortunate experience when I was in college playing basketball. One, one of the, the power forwards from the other team was running down the floor, and he turned his head and tripped over his feet or something. And this is a 6'9 guy. When he hit the floor, he separated both of his shoulders in an instant. Which, if you're wearing a tank top, looking at people with separated shoulders is kind of gruesome because they don't look right. But what was so terrifying is the 6'9, 240-pound guy couldn't get off the floor because his shoulders weren't working. And so he just laid there face down on the floor screaming, terrified me. And I tried to help him up, but I was 160 pounds. I wasn't much help. But his arms weren't detached. They were dislocated. Everything's all in the skin. It's just not working right. That's what it means to be dislocated. And verse 12 says, Paul gave these apostles, these prophets, these evangelists, these teacher pastors to help bring things back into alignment. This is job description part A for me. I am one of these people that Paul talks about. And my job is to help our church come back into alignment. Because as it is, when we become members of a church, in some ways we are dislocated. Now we're alongside one another, right? We're sitting alongside and that's great. But we're not all working like we should when everything's in alignment. That's somewhat of a lifelong goal, I think, for every individual church. And I get to be part of that because I'm in the list. Now, I don't want to take a lot of time on the list, but when he says Christ gave apostles, apostles are people who met 
and talked with the resurrected Christ. Which, they're all gone. <laughs> there are no more apostles. If someone comes to you and tells you they're an apostle, be very suspicious of that, okay? <laughs> However, thanks be to God's word, we have their influence, we have their thoughts and feelings recorded in Scripture. So part of the reason, or part of the group's that Christ gave to help us become in alignment, our apostles, which we have here. And then he mentions prophets. Prophets are not apostles. Prophets are traveling teachers who go from place to place and maybe church to church and talk about what the apostles have said and how to put it into practice. Those are prophets. And then he talks about evangelists. These are people who are going to, they're travelers too, they're traveling from place to place to try to persuade different people that their, their, uh, their animosity or the obstacles they have with the gospel actually uh, can be answered in A, B, C. They have answers for all of those problems. That's an evangelist. And then he mentions actually one group that in our English Bibles we've put into two for some reason. He says pastors and teachers. There is no word and there. We've just inserted it because in English we hate seeing two nouns next to each other without something else in between them. So it's actually pastor teachers, which are just like prophets except for one thing. They don't travel around. They stay in one spot and just get to know an area and a group of people. This would be me. Although, <laughs> since I've become a Christian, I've been in five different churches, uh, so I've Sometimes I feel like I'm the other one, but I don't want to be. I want to be the one that stays still. So that's the group that Christ has given to all of us to help us align. And we align, we get out of dislocation and into location, I guess you could say, when we are figuring out and using all of the gifts that Christ has given us. To each one of us, He has given that grace. And so part of our job as the church is figuring this out. Where are we? So I want to spend some time, the rest of our time this morning, naming what these gifts are throughout Scripture. Uh, they're in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Romans 16, 1 Peter 4, and two other places I can't think of off the top of my head. But they're all over, and we will, uh, on our website, list all of the things I'm telling you and give their, their scriptural reference. But if you don't want to wait for that, that you'll notice on your note page, my name and email is there. And part of the reason is, if there's something that I just go by too fast and you would like to have a further conversation, that's what it's for. If you have a question, if you have a complaint, I'm going to give you our administrator's email. But uh, for, the, for now, I've got mine. If you want to have a discussion about something, if you can't write fast enough, if you would like all of these notes that I type out, I'll just email them to you. That's the one way to to get that, okay? So let's get into the gifts. There are two categories of gifts listed throughout Scripture, uh, and those are talking gifts and doing gifts. And as we talk about these, ask yourself, which ones of these maybe has God given me? It's not something you've earned. It's something you were given when you were born again with. So here we go. Number one, teaching gift we'll talk about, or talking gift is teaching. Teaching is the first talking gift. Now, you have this gift when you can pass on spiritual truths in ways that do two things. In ways that people remember and in ways that motivate people to put it into practice and apply it when you're not around. That's how you know when you have that teaching gift. And I also put a warning on this one. If you think this is your gift, you better make sure others confirm that. Because I've had people come up to me and say, I know God has given me the teaching gift. And I would say, what do others who have heard you teach say? And they say, I've never taught. And I say, well, then the verdict's not in yet. <laughs> because if you teach and they snore, you don't have it. If you teach and they forget, you don't have it. If you teach and they are zero motivated to put into practice anything that you talked about, you don't have it. You don't get to decide if you have the teaching gift or not. Others will tell you if they do, okay? That's the first talking gift is teaching. The second one we'll talk about is called exhortation. And this one's kind of like a, a counseling gift. 
If you have this one, you're really good at helping people move toward godly action, godly decision. They get better at managing life. Most good counselors have this type of gift. And it's not always, it's also sometimes called the gift of encouragement, but it doesn't always mean just to pat on the back and go, oh, it's so, I'm glad you shared that. You know, it's not, all, not always. Sometimes a good exhorter will confront, not just encourage. But when they do, if you've had someone speak to you who has the gift of exhortation and they've confronted you, somehow you've liked it. The third one is the gift of prophecy. Now this one is, if you have this gift, it means you apply God's word to a person, to an individual in a way that really hits home for them, that is really convicting for them. And a warning on this one, the gift of prophecy does not have to occur in public and it does not have to occur with strangers, although that seems to be many people's favorite ones. There's charismatic churches that, that promote the gift of prophecy and say if you come to our church service, somewhere in it, you'll come forward and you'll meet a stranger who will tell you something that you need to know for your life. And some people love hearing that because when it's a stranger, how could they know what's going on in your life unless by some miracle? And I would say, yeah, that's possible. But it's no less of a prophetic gift if someone you've known for years comes to you in private through an email, through a letter, through a text or something and says, I've been thinking about you and as I read this, this seems to apply to your situation. We like to make it dramatic when it's a stranger and it's in a church service. And just know it doesn't have to be that. There's nothing to biblically support it must do that. We just like it because it's, it's more exciting that way. But if you have the gift of prophecy, it means you apply God's word to other people really specifically in ways that make them feel very encouraged and very convicted. The fourth one we'll talk about is the gift of pastor, the fourth talking gift. And the best word I can put with this one is tender. It's a tender ability to walk alongside life with people and to help them maybe not make decisions and maybe not become better parents, but you're, you're very interested in helping them draw near to their Heavenly Father with a sincere heart and you're good at it. And I, we haven't got this far through each of these, but just before we go any further, there's nothing, there's no biblical evidence that any of these gifts are gender specific. Where only men have this one and only women have this one. There's nothing like that. There are many, many women who have teaching gifts, exhortation gifts, prophecy gifts, and pastor gifts. Many. And there's even some men who have a pastor gift who are tender. I don't know if I'm one, but I would like to be one. <laughs> the fifth one is evangelism. The fifth talking gift is evangelism. You know you have this gift if you relate really well to people who have barriers to the gospel and barriers to church. And you can relate to them. And they're defiance or their objections or their barriers doesn't offend you it makes you actually want to come closer to them with genuine curiosity and get to know where they're coming from and why they think that it also means you communicate in persuasive ways and again if you think you communicate in persuasive ways the only way to figure that out is ask the people who you're trying to persuade because a lot of people think they're persuasive when actually they're just annoying so there is a difference between being persuasive and annoying, okay? Number six is discernment. The spiritual gift of discernment is someone who can judge motives accurately. Now, there may be men who have this. I've just never met any. Women are incredibly gifted this way. And if you're, married, if you're a guy married to a woman, sometimes this is hard. But if you have this gift... 
you also need to know you're not just good at judging others' motives accurately, you're also very good at judging your own motives accurately. And some people love to be experts in what other people are thinking and feeling and are completely clueless as to what they are thinking and feeling. They can't detect pride or ego in themselves, but they're good at noticing it in others. And I would say, no, I don't think you have the gift of discernment if that's the case. You have the hobby of judgmentalism. (laughs) That's not a gift. But if you have that gift, you're as interested in your own motives and are as adept at figuring out your own as you are others. Because you are gifted by God to recognize what is from Him and what's not from Him. That's the discernment gift. Number seven is the gift of leadership. This is someone who brings exciting clarity to the unknown. Something that's far off that no one can see yet, but the leader can see it, and as they communicate it, it starts to make you excited. And you start to see what they see. And these people are, they're passionate about where we need to go. They're not the best at figuring out how to get there, but they're really good at seeing where we need to be. They're big picture people. Number eight is a faith gift, a faith communicating gift. This is someone who really has two things going on. They know the promises of God, and they are supremely confident in them, confident in them, no matter the circumstances. So To be a Christian, everyone's going to have to exercise faith, but this one has this unbelievable ability to infect others to trust in the unknown. Some people think they have the gift of faith, but they're condescending because they're always complaining about those who aren't exercising life with faith. They don't have enough faith. Why don't they have enough faith? The Bible says you just need to trust. How come they're not trusting? And I would say you don't have the gift of faith. Because again, if you have it, your faith is infectious. It's not repulsive. So those are eight talking spiritual gifts. Maybe you have some of those. Maybe not. And that's okay, because we got eight more (laughs) that we'll look at. So let's finish here by looking at the doing gifts. As we look at doing gifts, the first one we'll talk about is the gift of giving. The spiritual gift of giving, where you have an uncanny ability to spot practical needs in someone and then actually meet them. Spotting, thoughtfully spotting, and generously meeting them in such a way that it produces spiritual fruit. So, in case you are good at writing checks, it doesn't mean you have the spiritual gift of giving, if unless when you do that, spiritual fruit is created in that individual's life, meaning they become more patient, they become more loving, they become more grateful, they become more forgiving. Uh, All the spiritual fruit, just work your way through the list. And please don't equate the gift of giving with the talent of earning. Some people have the talent of earning money in life, which is great. But that doesn't mean they have the gift of giving, and it doesn't work the other way around. The second one we'll talk about in the doing category is the gift of serving. The serving is someone who fills necessary gaps. who They see tasks that will free up other people to maximize their contributions, and they are excited to fill those gaps and to do those things. There was a gentleman I knew in Arkansas who had the spiritual gift of serving because he had an ability to, I don't even know how he did this, but he could tell instinctively when someone was a single mom or not. And he would find out their contact information through the church in not a creepy way, but in that way. And then he would take care of their vehicles. And he did that for dozens and dozens of, of moms, and not just the ones in our church. I mean, he looked forward to doing that on and on and on because he thought they have enough on their plate. I would like to take care of that one thing so they don't have to. That's an example of the spiritual gift of serving. And I wanted to give you an example because now we're going to talk about the spiritual gift of helps, which sounds a lot like serving, but it's actually different. The spiritual gift of helps 
is an assistant. It's an assisting gift. Instead of looking at things you can do to help others out, you tend to zero in on one or two people and do all of the things you can think of to help out that individual. Not just serving cars. It would be like coming alongside of one or two single moms and helping them with child care and helping them with their house and helping them in all the ways you can think of, not just one particular one. Do you see the difference? Serving is kind of a broader one. Helps is, a, is a, an assistant. The fourth one is the gift of healing. Now, this one is measured differently, unfortunately. So at least the biblical work that I've done, here's the best way I can describe it. First, it's someone who's very compassionate towards the ill or the injured. If you hear prayer requests about someone who's hurting and, and or suffering from something physically and you kind of nod off and you start thinking of other things to do, this is probably not you. But if that moves you inside, if that really bothers you, if that creates a burden in you, maybe. And so when this person talks about healing or actually just lays their hands on someone and prays for healing, sometimes it comes. But if you have the gift of healing, it means you are not deterred when God chooses not to heal. Because ultimately, it's in His hands. So people I've seen with the gift of healing, yeah, there's people who've been incredibly blessed through their serving. And some people haven't gotten healed, but that's up to God and not them, and they know that, and they're not deterred. Number five is the gift of mercy. This is someone who will come alongside some of the worst suffering you can go through. And when I mean worst, I don't mean like we're comparing suffering and so your pile's bigger than their pile. That's not what I mean. I mean to you, it's emotionally wrecking, which could be anything. But these people want to come alongside someone who's suffering something really distressing to them, and they can enter into the pain in some way, even if they haven't experienced it themselves. That's a big part of the gift of mercy. These are people who have very high pain tolerances for tragedies. Because some of you think about going to talk to someone who's hurting deeply, and it, that takes you out for a week. It's, a, it's draining, right? Right? These people that God has given them the spiritual gift of mercy, which shows up a lot through empathy, it doesn't. It energizes them to come alongside and join into that suffering. That's mercy. Number six is the gift of hospitality. And again, this one's been mistaken a lot over the years. If you don't have a big house with a big living room with a big pantry and a big dining room, then you can't have the gift of hospitality. That's silly. So let me explain what the gift of hospitality is. It's someone who loves to use their resources, like their home, their food, their money, their, their creativity. They love to use their resources to refresh other people. They love it. Don't mistake the gift of hospitality with the gift of earning again. Some of you have hospitality gifts, and you're not really sure you have it. But you know because after people leave your presence and leave your home, they feel better. They feel refreshed. If you have a home where people are constantly nervous to touch something because they might break it, you probably don't have it. You have the talent of decorating, but not the gift of hospitality. There's a big difference. Number seven is the gift of administration, which is a lot like leadership. In fact, those two actually need to come together. The leadership gift means you can see where we need to go. It's hard for others to see it, but you can see it and you are passionate about where to go. The person who's gifted at administration can't see that, but once you show them the picture, they can see how to get there. They can see the steps necessary, one, then two, then three. If this is what you want, then this is how, what you should do to arrive at that. 
These are detail-oriented people, not big-picture people. And sometimes leaders try to be administrators, and it drives everybody around them nuts. Because they don't know how to break it up into where you should go next, and so they just say, look, I, as long as we're moving in that direction, I don't care, but everyone else cares. And administrators who try to paint a picture that they can't paint isn't helping anyone either. You actually need both of them. Someone who sees where to go and someone who says, I know how to get there. Let's come together. Number eight is the wisdom gift. Now this one's a lot like discernment, but instead of judging motives like discernment does, the wisdom gift judges situations, sees specific problems and solutions, not in people, but in things. And God has given them the ability and sometimes the years, and oftentimes the years, to come up with this. You may not have had the spiritual gift of wisdom when you were 20, but by the time you're 60, you might have it. So again, it's judging situations accurately. Not motives, but situations. That's wisdom. Those are the eight in that. So, now that we've gone through our eight of those, and the eight talking gifts, I want you to know... If you are born again, you have some of those. I've never met anyone who's only got one, ever. So I'm going to say plural. You've got them. Do you know them? Next week when we get together, I'm going to talk about how to figure out whether you have them. And this is going to surprise you what I'm going to talk about because I'm not going to give you a test on the screen and you fill out something. I think those are kind of crazy, to be honest. So I'm going to share with you from Ephesians how to figure out what your gifts are. 